Hi, and welcome to Viewmaster Travels. My name's Dave, and I collect vintage Viewmaster reels. Each of these has seven 3D pictures taken over 70 years ago, and I've been visiting these places to find them. I'm going to show you each of the pictures, point them out on a map, and show what's there today. And we'll see what history we can learn along the way. This time it's Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's reel number SP9036 from 1948. Albuquerque is in north central New Mexico. Today it's the most populated city in New Mexico, but it's not the capital. That's Santa Fe, just a bit further north. Under Spanish rule, very few people lived in the area. It was just the valley on the main route south from Santa Fe to Mexico City. In the early 1700s, the Spanish governor Francisco Cuervo y Valdez wanted to make a name for himself and declared the fourth royally chartered town in his state, naming it La Villa de San Francisco Javier de Albuquerque after his boss, the Duke of Albuquerque. To have a royal charter, he needed to build a central plaza with a church and government buildings and have at least 30 families living there. He didn't really have all that, though. He did build the church, but only 129 people lived in the general area, and they only stayed in the plaza buildings on Sundays. No one back home in Spain seemed to notice this, though, and the charter remained. As an interesting side note, the spelling of the city name has changed over the years, originally with two R's, like on this old map from 1769 and this 1850s account of the conquest of New Mexico. But in this history book of New Mexico from 1914, the spelling's been changed. Legend has it when the railroad came to town, the station masters had trouble pronouncing the name, so they dropped the first rolling R. Any how you spell it, the first location we needed to find was on that small town plaza. Church of San Felipe, Old Albuquerque Plaza. Old Albuquerque refers to that original Spanish plaza area, which is here on this old bird's eye map from 1886. And from the town's charter, we know the church would have been on the plaza, and you can see the church drawn on the map here. Today, the Old Town area is a tourist destination with shops and museums. It's even been circled in red on this vintage tourist map I found, so we headed over there. Once there, the church was easy to find. The old plaza was very similar to the plaza in Santa Fe, which makes sense because both were royal charters of Spain. The church itself dominates the plaza and seems to be a mishmash of styles, with the Pueblo wall along the front and these Gothic towers overlooking it. It was built as part of the Royal Charter in 1706, although it was almost entirely rebuilt in 1793 and revised many times throughout the 1800s. It's been in continual use for 316 years, and you can see evidence of all this history in the mix of architectural details inside and out. We briefly explored this church, but it's not really very big, so then we wandered around the plaza. Some of the other buildings around the plaza look very similar to their counterparts in Santa Fe, but one unique thing we found were these two Civil War cannons, buried in 1862 by the retreating Confederate Army to prevent their capture. They were dug out of a chili pepper field a quarter century later and put on display in the plaza. These are replicas. The original pair are now in the local museum. This little plaza area was really all there was to see of Albuquerque in the 1800s. In 1880, though, something happened that changed everything. At Albuquerque Station. This is the famous Santa Fe rail line that connected the American Midwest to the West, and finding the station was pretty easy. It's over here, a couple miles from the plaza. Our first question, though, was, why isn't the central plaza in the middle of town anymore? 
Turns out the Santa Fe rail line followed a relatively straight north-south line and didn't follow the curves of the Rio Grande River, so ended up bypassing the town of Albuquerque, arriving at a station over here, a few miles to the east. Real estate speculators knew where the railroad would go and bought up everything in this area, and they incorporated it all into a new town in 1885, naming it New Albuquerque. A mule-drawn tram line was built to connect the new town to the old, and you can see them here on the bird's eye map. These were eventually replaced by electric trams and then by buses. New Albuquerque quickly outgrew old Albuquerque, which ended up getting absorbed by the larger city in 1949. When we reached the station, though, it was obvious things had changed a lot. What's there now doesn't match the original picture at all. This revealed one of Albuquerque's greatest architectural losses, the demolition of the Alvarado Hotel, the largest of the Fred Harvey houses. The Fred Harvey houses were a series of hotels and restaurants built along the new railroads leading out west. They're intrinsically linked with tourism and the taming of the Wild West, as these rest stops truly civilized the arduous journey across the country. Fred Harvey was a railroad freight agent who took on a contract in 1876 to manage a cafeteria on the Santa Fe line in Topeka, Kansas. He soon expanded to other stops on the line and created the U.S.'s first restaurant chain by adding locations across the country all the way to Los Angeles. Eventually, his company had 84 Harvey houses and was the sixth largest food retailer in the United States. And as we followed Route 66 West, we saw several of these locations. Albuquerque was an attractive location for a new Fred Harvey house, so the Santa Fe Company built the Alvarado Hotel in 1902, leasing it to the Fred Harvey Company to run. This would become the largest of all the Harvey houses and was the first to include a Native American curio shop named the Indian Building. Here, Fred Harvey sold Native American arts and crafts to visitors from the East. Exploiting the Native culture quickly became an entirely new business for him, eventually offering multi-day automobile tours of the local pueblos he called Indian Detours. Riding in a Harvey car through the southwest on one of these expeditions became a reason of its own to take the train to New Mexico. However, by 1970, travel by rail had given way to travel by freeway, and the railroad hotel closed. The Santa Fe Railroad Company announced that the landmark building would be demolished. Local citizens rushed to get the building on the Registry of Historic Places, getting approved the same day the demolition began. Concerned citizens sent urgent telegrams to President Nixon to save the building, but were informed by the White House that the National Registry protected the building only from federally funded projects, but not from the actions of the building's owners. Since the Santa Fe Railroad Company owned the building, they were free to knock it down. Protests were organized, but no one seemed to care. Only a couple hundred people attended the public meetings, and the demolition continued as planned. Today, a minimalist, functional station stands where the Alvarado once was, and only the name remains. The Alvarado suffered as travel by train was replaced by travel by car, and our next stop reflects that. Central Avenue looking west. Central Avenue was easy to find on the map. It runs east to west, right through town. It's actually the same road that the mule-drawn trams followed on their way to Old Town from the train station. Since the railroad built the road, they named it Railroad Avenue. But in 1907, the city renamed it to Central Avenue, since it had become the central thoroughfare through town. Finding this exact location was a challenge though, but luckily these two buildings are still standing and we found them online pretty quickly. 
Turns out the Viewmaster photographer didn't go very far to get this picture, since the only place with this view would be from a train window arriving at Albuquerque Station, so I think he took this shot as he first arrived in town. Central Avenue's big claim to fame is that it would become the path of Route 66 through town, and weirdly enough, this is the only location along the route where one alignment of 66 intersects with another. Route 66 used to run from Santa Fe south to Albuquerque and then along 4th Street, but it was later changed to run along Central Avenue, and here in the Viewmaster picture is that intersection. It's a unique spot along all of Route 66. The two landmark buildings we use to find this spot are the First National Bank Building and the Sunshine Building. The bank building was Albuquerque's first skyscraper, built in 1923, and it was the tallest building in town when the Viewmaster picture was taken. It was also the headquarters of the company that made the map I'm using. Across the street, the Sunshine Building was built a year later in 1924, and it was Albuquerque's first movie palace, showing movies up until the mid-80s. Now it's a live music venue. Traveling west along Central Avenue leads back to Old Town, but our next target was in the other direction. Administration Building, University of New Mexico. This was a challenge to find. The current campus map doesn't list an administration building, and I wasn't even sure this old admin building was still standing. But after quite some wandering around campus, we found it, now mostly obscured by trees. This building is Shoals Hall, built in 1936. It was the first of several buildings built on campus in the Pueblo Revival style by architect John Gaw Meme, who'd done the La Fonda Inn in Santa Fe a few years earlier. The University of New Mexico was founded in 1889, east of the train station on a hill north of Railroad Avenue. The first campus building was Hodgen Hall, built three years later in a more traditional Midwestern style. It was the university's only building for almost 10 years. In the 1900s, new university buildings were added in the popular Pueblo Revival style. This local style of architecture continued as buildings were added for the first half of the 20th century, and the administration building was one of the more famous of these designs, which is why I think our Viewmaster photographer captured it. We wandered around campus for a while longer, but our next target was east, past the university. U.S. Highway 66 through Tierras Canyon. When the Viewmaster picture was taken, Central Avenue was Route 66, and following Central East leads into Tierras Canyon. But we'd come into town on Route 66 from the north. So why were there two Route 66s in town? First, a little background. As we've seen, travel across the U.S. started with wagon trails, like the Santa Fe Trail, and then on railroads, like the Santa Fe Railway. But as the car gained popularity, there was a demand for cross-country roads. In the early 20th century, rough auto trails crisscrossed the country, some well-marked and maintained, some not. The most famous of these was the Lincoln Highway, running from New York to San Francisco, but there were many others. In 1926, Congress began numbering sections of these existing auto trails, creating a nationwide coordinated highway system. A route from Chicago to Los Angeles was defined and given the number 66. Much of it used existing, non-paved roads between small towns. In New Mexico, the route ran up to the state capital of Santa Fe and then down to Albuquerque, and this was the original Route 66. And it's at this point things get weird. Legend has it that during the Roaring Twenties, the state of New Mexico was controlled by the Santa Fe Ring, a conspiracy of Republican businessmen based in the state's capital. However, 
The state's governor, Arthur T. Hannett, was a Democrat, and when he was up for re-election, he lost to a Republican, Richard Dillon. Hannett thought for sure the Santa Fe ring was responsible for his loss, and he wanted revenge, so he hatched a plan to make the Santa Fe ring pay. Turns out, Hannett used to be on the State Highway Commission, and with 60 days left as governor, he gathered his construction cronies into a room with a map. He drew a straight line from Albuquerque to Santa Rosa and said, make this a road. Two separate construction crews worked 24-7 from each end of the line, racing to meet in the middle by the end of the year. If Hannett could complete his road before leaving office, he could divert Route 66 away from Santa Fe entirely. His term ended, and his road was days short of completion. The new governor took office and immediately sent an engineer to halt the construction, but a freak snowstorm blocked his way. By the time the engineer could get across the mountains, the new road was finished and the first cars were using it. The new Route 66 alignment was done. I feel kind of bad for Santa Fe. The railroad had already passed them by, and now so did the highway. This is the only picture of Route 66 in my entire Viewmaster collection, and I think it's cool that it happens to be of the section that became known as Hannett's Joke. And our next stop was just a quick left turn from there. Loop Road Through Sandia Mountains From this point on the old Route 66, you can head north into the Sandia Mountains, and this is the Sandia Loop Road, famous for the views from the mountain peaks. Looking at the map though, this drive takes well over an hour, so we took a shortcut that wasn't available to our Viewmaster photographer. This is the Sandia Peak Tramway, a 2.7 mile ride straight up the mountain, the second longest tramway ride in the world getting us to the top of the mountain in 15 minutes. The loop road itself was built by the U.S. Forest Service, first reaching the crest of the mountain in 1927. Nine years later, the Sandia Peak ski area opened, and when the Viewmaster picture was taken, the scenic drive, mountain views, and ski resorts were very popular tourist attractions. The tramway was completed in 1966 by the Sandia Peak Ski Company, which had been founded by Robert Nordhaus and Ben Abruzzo. Abruzzo was a famous balloonist who'd been on the crews that were the first to balloon across both the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. He's also the reason Albuquerque is now famous for its annual balloon festival, now one of Albuquerque's largest tourist attractions. We rode the tram to the top, and the views are spectacular. It was early spring, and there was still remnants of snow on the ground. We got a lot of good hiking in, exploring the ski trails. Then we stopped for lunch at a great mountaintop restaurant that has panoramic views of the area. And that was the last photo to find, and the view from the top of the mountain was a great conclusion to our photo scavenger hunt. It was interesting visiting Albuquerque right after Santa Fe. Comparing the two cities was inevitable. Albuquerque has really benefited from being on the main highway, becoming a major crossroads for travel in all four directions. Today, it's a major city with traffic and freeway congestion and has much less of an identity than Santa Fe. But Albuquerque's history can still be found if you know where to look, and it seems that this big city has a lot more to offer. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching.